Hey, Jonathan from AJ and Smart here, and this is the ultimate step-by-step -step guide to running a remote design sprint. In the video you're about to see, our senior product director, Tim Hofer, runs through how we at AJ and Smart run remote design sprints for our clients. We're gonna be showing you the digital whiteboard we use, how we transform all of the exercises into digital format, and basically everything you could possibly want to know about running a design sprint remotely. I hope you love it. Let us know in the comments what else you wanna know. Let us know in the comments if you liked it. Please hit the like button, please subscribe. We're trying to grow this channel. We appreciate your attention. Thank you so much. I'm gonna hand over to Tim now, take it away. I am going to show you exactly how we run remote sprints with our clients using a tool called Miro. So Miro is a digital whiteboard tool and um, there, there are a couple of other great options out there. We have heard really good things about Mural as well. So uh, it doesn't really matter if you're using Miro or Mural or maybe there are other tools that you're using. Most of these tools have similar features and I'm also going to show you why it's not that important to worry about specific features uh, as long as you um, can work as a team in collaboration with uh, people remotely. You don't need that much to actually run and facilitate a sprint. So let's jump right in. Before we start working with our client in a workshop, we always make time to onboard them both to the sprint process and to the tool that we will be using in the workshop. So in the case of Miro, we have uh, this little sandbox uh, prepared for them. The most important thing that they need to learn is how do I navigate through uh, the workshop space? So here we have an outline of all the frames that are on the board. So it's really easy for the facilitator if people are getting lost to say, hey, everybody, please take a look at the outline and join me uh, at number three, the map, uh, once you click on it, you immediately jump there. So it's very convenient uh, to get around. Another thing that's important is uh, teaching them how to swipe and zoom. Uh, this is something that I think most people are probably familiar with, especially if you're watching this video, but you would be surprised how many people working for large enterprises or companies actually don't know how to do this because all they're doing uh, at work is essentially navigating uh, spreadsheets. So this is really useful to, to show them because this will be a completely new experience for them, uh, taking the time um, to show them how to swipe, swipe around the workspace. This will make life so much easier for them and I think they will really appreciate if you do that. The other thing that is really good to know is even though, as you can see here, there is a bunch of really powerful features in Miro and also in Mural and other tools, you don't actually need most of them. For the purpose of uh, running a remote sprint, the most important things that participants need to be able to do is, first of all, uh, select uh, an element and uh, copy it quickly and also uh, use it and uh, write write something write something on the sticky note so like here we're just showing them uh, how to move the sticky note like this here and also how to copy it so if you press down option and you drag it like this you make an instant copy uh, but you can also of course just use copy paste that's also fine so and that's pretty much all that they need to understand to make use of this of this tool which is which is i think really really important because it's quite overwhelming every time you're onboarding people to a new tool it's intimidating seeing so many great features and maybe not make being able to make sense of most of them so if that happens and people are worried about this just tell them don't worry you don't need to do much i'm just going to show you exactly how it's done so now Let's move on to the structure of the sprint that we have prepared here in our sprint template. And I'm also going to show you later on how these things look in practice. So the first thing um, that is maybe good to know is that unlike a real uh, in-person sprint, we are actually changing the structure uh, and the timetable of the workshop slightly. So usually for an in-person, sprint workshop, we are blocking 
two full days and for uh, the same workshop in a remote setting we are actually blocking three half days so uh, we are assuming that we are doing the entire problem framing part or end of the uh, end of the first week then we are running two more workshops the next week uh, on two days so uh, that we can keep the remote sessions quite short because it's very exhausting sitting in front of your computer the entire time uh, it's very easy to lose focus and get distracted so our recommendation would be change the timetable in a way that allows you to keep the workshop the workshops a bit more focused and a bit uh, more concise and uh, you will need to find the perfect stopping point for every day um, to make that work um, but I'm going to show you exactly how we do it so the actual workshop itself doesn't really change too much I mean you can pretty much see every exercise here on the board you have the map you have the how might we challenges then we have something here to capture the top voted how might we a two-year goal sprint questions and then we also have a sheet here where we can paste the final long-term goal and the sprint questions so that we have a nice little artifact and a checkpoint for people to refer back to. So in a way, a digital whiteboard uh, workspace becomes almost like this living document um, that the facilitator can also change and adapt in preparation of the next workshops. So yeah, you can see how, how this looks like. Uh, this is where we're capturing the concept gallery and it all ends with user test flow storyboard and then we are at the wall of justice for running user tests so this is uh, also uh, something i'm going to show you in detail because i think it's very interesting for people to uh, to see how how that exactly works in a remote sprint so let's move on what i want to show you now is something that's really important um, to understand and um because a lot of people ask us, so how do you do the map in a remote setting or how do you do lightning demos? So one thing that I, I need to make I need to make it clear is that we're never starting from a blank slate. So what you just saw earlier is kind of like these empty templates. A client will never see that. Um, whenever we are starting the workshop, we are always using a template that has been pre-populated and pre-filled with uh, artifacts and ideas and sticky notes that are based on client interviews we did in preparation of the workshop. So the map is actually something that we would have ready to discuss and have a structured conversation around already in Miro, um, like this year. So uh, we would have the facilitator kind of like present this map back to the group and then also allow the participants to give feedback, make suggestions how to how to change things. Like, for example, maybe there is something in there that is actually not, not relevant at all. We can just delete it like this. Uh, as you can see, it's also just like a list of bullet points, which makes it really, really easy to just add new stuff like this here. And you can also move things around quite easily. So if you realize, oh, there's actually a step, step missing here, let me just uh, quickly create a new uh, a new block here. That's really easy to do. It's actually way easier than doing the same thing on a whiteboard where you have to rub everything off the whiteboard and then you have to rewrite everything. It, it, it can be quite tedious to do that. So uh, if you if you have the opportunity to work in a digital whiteboard, I think after a couple of times, you will really appreciate how much time you're saving doing this. So the map uh, is one thing that we are already preparing same with the challenges and i'm also going to talk quickly about voting here so this is pretty much the the state that clients would see when the workshop starts so we would just uh quickly allow them to look through each of these and maybe uh if they have any anything to add uh, at their own sticky notes like this here uh it is really easy to do so in Miro, um, you actually have built-in voting functionalities where uh, you can just select uh, an area to uh, to vote on. And um, so this is too this is too big. Let me just make this a little bit smaller. So like this here. And uh, once you are 
done with the setup, you can define very granularly uh, what people can actually vote on. As you can see, it's it's a bit finicky, and I personally think it's it's a pretty good tool, but um, there is there is a drawback, and the drawback is that when people vote on these, you actually don't see the votes of other people before the timer goes off. So um, if if you're in a heat map situation where the voting is a bit of a trick, uh, like a mix of, you know, like actually people pointing out interesting features, but also a way for you to highlight specific f features that you want to get other people to notice, um, the built-in voting functionality doesn't work that well. Uh, another thing that is a bit of a drawback with the voting feature is that you can only vote on specific predetermined elements uh, in Miro. So if you are actually doing a heat map on a concept drawing, you can only vote on the entire image that you uploaded and not on specific features. So I'm going to show you how we uh, recreate the voting experience with uh, dot votes on Miro. So for this, we have just a little red dot here, and we're using that exactly like uh, like we would a, use a dot sticker in a in a real workshop. So, um, so this is also part of the onboarding, by the way. We're uh, explaining people how to copy and paste things. So we just tell them, everybody, copy this red dot here. Decider gets four dots. Everyone else gets two dots, uh, and now take your time to read through all of these and vote on the ones that you find most relevant. So um, I, I personally prefer uh, doing it this way because unlike uh, with uh, so unlike with the voting feature that is built in here, you can actually see uh, the votes built up while the voting is going on and you don't have to wait for the voting to finish to see the results, which is quite nice. This also allows the facilitator to see if maybe there is um, a very interesting and relevant challenge that maybe is is getting overlooked by the group and put put some additional uh, heat on that just so that that it gets people from the uh, sprint team to notice it more so it's it's a really good uh, it's a really good recreation of the the actual voting uh, in an in-person workshop and I just prefer prefer doing that. Another really interesting and nice benefit is it, it is just so cool to see people work together in real time. And this is something uh, that you should also know. Uh, so currently I'm alone on this board, but when there are other people joining the board, I can actually see them moving around, which is quite nice. So let's move on. So in the end, you have uh, your top voted How Might we? You're doing the exact same thing with uh, the two-year goal, you, uh, you're you doing the same thing with the sprint question, the can we questions. And like I said, um, we are never starting from a blank slate. So uh, at every time a client participant is coming to these exercise sheets here, they are already pre-filled with uh, suggestions from uh, from our side and we're getting these suggestions not like we're not pulling these suggestions out of thin air we're basing them on interviews we did before the workshop so a lot of uh, very often people will actually see their um, their concerns or their challenges uh, written out already by people from our team so once the voting is done we uh, have a sheet here where we're just capturing everything this uh, sheet here will come in handy later on because it's breaking down the long-term goal and the sprint questions in a really, uh, in a really uh, easy to understand way. And when we are uh, then going back to the map, when we are actually when we are actually placing the top voted how might we? Uh, this is also really easy to do. And you can just copy the sticky notes uh, and move them around like this here. So you can just do it like this here, and you can just move them. Uh, here and here and with the pen tool you can also uh, very easily draw um, uh, like the key the key area on the map that you need to work on really easy to do again uh, you can make that quite 
quite chunky here, quite visible as well. And it's also very easy to, to change and edit it. So it, this is making it really nice. So with the definition of the long-term goal and the sprint questions, we are actually ending the first, uh, the first workshop, the problem and challenge framing workshop. Uh, and it's the first time now that we're giving our participants homework to do on their own time is coming up with lightning demos. Um, and lightning demos are a really nice uh, homework um, because, uh, I mean, we are also giving them clear instructions what to do with the lightning demos, how to research them. And we're also asking them to submit their lightning demos uh, basically after a couple of hours after the workshop ended, because that allows the facilitator to upload the lightning demos to the board so the the participants from the client side don't have to worry about all of that the facilitators are taking care of that completely and also breaking it down in a way that is easy to present then uh, in the next workshop so another reason why we're doing that is because we want to avoid uh, our clients uh, working overtime or working on the weekend to prepare these lightning demos so we're telling them specifically look you you can run off now, the workshop is done. However, by the end of today, 6 p.m. your time, please send us your lightning demos with a few bullet points and um, send them directly to the facilitator. And the facilitator can then also check in if they don't receive any lightning demos. So to maybe coach them one-on-one -on -one to help them find really relevant lightning demos as well. So when the next workshop is starting, we already have the lightning demos prepared on a board that looks like this here and we are then taking turns to uh, present them one uh, one by one so another thing that is quite nice to do on a digital whiteboard is uh, embedding a little uh, video so it's it's really easy to just uh, capture a video and uh, show your uh, lightning demos like this. So uh, this this allows you to be very descriptive in uh, you know uh, communicating the big idea. Um, and you can also share links. So this is also something that is very uh, difficult to do in an in-person sprint. Um, it's really easy for participants if they are starting to sketch their own concept to go back to the lightning demos, uh, click on a link and um, just uh, look again at what the lightning demo was about. Okay, so these are the lightning demos and now let's take a look at the creation of the concept. So this is something that we get a lot of questions about, like what is the best way to sketch a concept in a, a digital whiteboard tool like Miro? Um, so the answer to this is we, we are actually just using the whiteboard tool to facilitate the sketching, but the sketching itself is happening together alone on paper with a Sharpie uh, in, uh, in person with every, with every participant. So the way you can imagine this to work is we are running them through the uh, instructions for something like the note taking. We're setting off the timer, which is also quite easy to do in a viral like this. So timer is running now. And uh, then we are just telling them uh, the specific steps that they need to be aware of. And um, otherwise, they can just remain sitting, they can just remain connected to the group call while they are doing this. And the nice thing about this is also that it is really easy for the facilitator to check in with individual participants. If if you find that uh, somebody is may maybe having trouble or is looking distracted, you can just check in with them directly and ask them if everything is okay, if they need help, if uh, there's anything you can do for them. So we are progressively disclosing the uh, concept sketching like this. We are moving through these four steps without uh, having uh, any kind of distraction. So then we're doing the crazy aids. Uh, as you can see, uh, it's all really easy to do with the built-in timer. And at the end, when we are starting our uh, solution concept, this is another instance when we are giving uh, the participants homework. So we don't necessarily need them to keep uh, logged into the call or the workshop working on this. However, we are giving them very clear guidance. We're telling them when they have to submit their concept, uh, either as a photo or a scan. Again, like the lightning demos, they send it to the facilitator and the facilitator is then preparing it for the uh, 
for the following workshop like this year. So you can see there is uh, nothing digital on here. It's all uh, on paper uh, with Sharpies, uh, like pretty standard concept sketches that you are familiar with from in-person sprints. And this is how we start off the last workshop of the first sprint week voting on the concepts again uh, we are using these red dots as votes and we're not using the built-in uh, uh, voting function functionality and again uh, the the decider can just place their decider dot on the winning concept or a feature that they really like and it's it's quite quite easy to do again this is where the built-in voting functionality won't won't be as helpful um, because you can only vote on a specific image, but not on parts of the image. So our advice would be just recreate these voting dots. It's it's a bit more visual and a nicer way to um, bring across the feeling of collaboration and really working as a team. Which brings me to the storyboard. We often get uh, questions: How do you how do you actually storyboard in a remote workshop? And so one thing that Adrian Smart is doing a bit uh, differently from the standard sprint process as it's described in Jake Knapp's book is that we um, introduced uh, a little pre-storyboard exercise called the user test flow to uh, structure the conversation around the storyboard a bit better. Because if you have if you have done a storyboard exercise with clients before, you know that it's it, it often tends to go uh, off the rails a little bit and then you know like you have these huge unstructured discussions about a specific screen and it's a lot of uh, you know like the artist like having to wipe things off the board and start from scratch and just to just to uh, introduce some guardrails and constraints to this entire process we came up with a user journey mapping hack and we're just calling it the user test flow. So we have a lot of resources on that. So I'm not going to explain the exercise too much, but essentially what we are doing here is we are defining a very high level version of what's going to happen in the prototype without going to, into too much detail, but just so that everybody is aligned on what is actually ha happening in the prototype. Even if we still don't really know what the screens will look like, we at least have an understanding of the important things that are happening in the prototype. Yeah, every participant is uh, creating their own version of that uh, uh, perfect prototyping flow. And in the end, we are voting on one of these flows and the decider can pick one main flow and also pick one extra post-it from another flow if they think that there's maybe a feature that is missing from this flow. Uh, and in the end, we're just combining this flow and adding it to the storyboard, which has been created here. So we're doing the storyboard in several several passes. So as you can see here, I've already copied over the post-its from the winning flow to the storyboard. And we are um, doing several passes of the storyboard. The first pass would be essentially us quickly running through each of these sticky notes here um, to keep everyone aligned on the story that uh, we want to have represented in the prototype. And then we are also uh, adding a couple of uh, additional bullet points. And this is what we are calling uh, breadboarding. It's based on uh, the shape up process uh, uh, Basecamp is using for product development. So essentially what this is, is it's uh, it's going one step deeper into detail compared to the sticky notes, but it's still not really on a wireframe level. So, so let's say we have the sticky note here, agent opens dashboard to create new update. Um, we, we might be able to just ask the client, like, what do you see actually happening on the dashboard? So let, let's just look at a few uh, like, like made up examples here. So this is what breadboarding uh, essentially looks like. It's, as you can see, it's very low-fi, but it's going into more detail than the sticky note. And this is, uh, so this is usually the, um, the second pass. Another thing that is really convenient is looking at the winning concept again, and you can just grab, uh, copy the winning concept, paste it in here, and then you can, 
you know, take the elements of the winning concept that are corresponding to the screen you're working on. So very often you don't actually have to sketch anything here. You can just uh, you can just take these uh, take these drawings and maybe add a few post-its like so you can just change the headline like this and uh, you can just annotate things it's re it's very easy to do another thing to keep in mind is that although the storyboard is going into uh, quite a lot of detail a lot of this detail is actually content and it's not so much coming up with the perfect design so very often it's completely sufficient to utilize uh, these built-in uh, shapes that are uh, part of the digital whiteboard. Let's say you want to create a navigation bar for your app. Um, I mean, this is really just a rectangle with a couple of other rectangles in it. So it is uh, it is quite simple to do that. And uh, I mean, of course you can go into uh, quite a lot of detail if, if it's necessary, but for many screens, it won't actually be necessary. The, the most important thing for the designer is to understand what's happening on each screen. What is the, what is the so what is the, uh, what is the tester able to do? Uh, so do I need to add any affordances for a new uh, workflow, for example, like button? As long as you can add this level of detail, uh, it's quite easy to storyboard like that. Another thing to keep in mind as well is usually in every prototype, you only have one to two key screens that are essentially 90% of the idea that you're trying to convey and everything else is screens that are not as important to uh, figure out in detail. It, it can make a lot of sense to just spend a lot of time uh, mapping, out, mapping out these uh, key screens and when you have a capable artist on your team they can quickly whip up something that is almost on a wireframe level uh, for example, th with these built-in uh, functionalities here, let's say uh, you just want to show uh, there's a pop-up showing up. Hey, uh, uh, there's a suspicious activity like this here. Boom, done. Uh, really easy to do. Um, it might take a while to get a hang of it, but so in general, it's 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 not a huge problem. And as long as you uh, stick to the process I showed you before, so kind of like progressively adding more detail, starting off with the sticky notes, then moving on to breadboarding, using things like the existing drawings with a few annotations, and then for key screens, you can actually create a more high fidelity, uh, almost like wireframe type layouts of each individual screen. And this is the storyboard and uh, with the end of the storyboard also ends the first series of workshops for the sprint and now i'm also going to show you how we capture testing notes in miro so this is actually how we uh, started using miro um, in in sprints this was at a time when most of our sprint workshops were actually in person uh, we realized that it's a lot more efficient and uh, a lot easier to take all the notes from user tests in digital format uh, uh, using my role. So here you can see the, the end result of one testing day. And uh, how that usually works is that we are working with two people. Each person has their own laptop in front of them. You have uh, the person conducting the interview and actually talking to the testers. And then you have the note taker and both the note taker and the interviewer have the Miro board open and can quickly add and capture all the feedback that that is coming from the tester. So this is actually way faster to do than uh, on paper. Uh, it's also producing a lot less waste and you can also uh, work a lot better as a team and the, like both always have a complete visibility of uh, what the other person is actually adding to the board. So it's really easy to add notes like this here and then uh, copy uh, new post-it notes or just paste them here. So uh, another thing that is really nice is that you can very quickly change the color of the post-its here. It's, it's very convenient to do. 
and uh, you can also sort the post-it notes, which is uh, which is really which is really useful. So using these different colors, when you look at the different colors of the sticky notes, it's really easy to see patterns emerge. Like maybe uh, so, there's a lot of critical feedback on this topic here, escalation. There must be uh, some issue with it, or uh, there are a couple of features that get a lot of positive feedback here. So all of this is really nice. And then in the end, we are also looking at adding the sprint questions to the board and uh, can get a very quick uh, can get a very quick yes or no answer on all of these, and uh, that makes it really easy. And we also have things like the intro script prepared here, so uh, this is really easy to to test with. Hey, Jonathan here again. I hope you enjoyed that video. Like I said, leave a comment down below if you want to know anything else about remote design sprints or remote workshops. Uh, do hit the like button, do hit subscribe if you enjoyed this video. And thank you so much for watching. See you next week.